seeing that together. I've been out of the pulpit for a week, so uh, actually two weeks. And uh, so it's been three weeks since we've been in this chapter. And I, I'm going to do a little review, but not so much in the scripture reading. I just want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Uh, some just profound verses that you should be aware of. You should know that from the very way it starts. I'll give you a moment to get there, and then I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray that as we think about this verse, even the context of the passage, that uh, the minds of our understanding would be enlightened, and that if there's anyone here that didn't, doesn't know how to be saved, that certainly today they would understand what the gospel is and be saved, but that every saved person would realize what this passage is telling them, that they should know that their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that we should glorify you in our spirit and our body because they belong to you now. So we pray that this will get across today and speak to the hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. That statement there, we'll, we'll talk about the gospel in just a little bit, but that statement there, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Uh, you're not your own, you're bought with a price, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's, they belong to him. That's apostrophe S. I, I say that, but I actually titled the message, glorifying God in your body and spirit, which are his. Because when you just say God's, you can't hear the apostrophe unless you hear the context there, meaning belong to him. You're not God. But you belong to God when you trust in Jesus Christ as your savior because you're bought with a price. By the way, do you see the Trinity in the passage? That your body, it says, uh, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it says in verse 20, for you're bought with a price. Now the name isn't there, but the price is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shed his blood to pay for your sins, to redeem you from your sins, so that you would no longer belong to the devil, that you would no longer be a, 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 on, on your way to hell, but that you would be belong to the Lord, and you would belong to God in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 23. It says you belong to Christ. This verse says you belong to God. That would be the Father. But anyhow, it's through the, the blood shed uh, at the cross where you, you're bought with a price and therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit there all involved in you becoming saved and, and then set apart for God's service and for his glory. Um, there is a, I don't know if you noticed the poem that was in last week's bulletin. I actually, after I read it a second time, I cut it out and put it in my Bible. But just the beginning of that has the very thought of what we're talking about here, where the poem read, by his creative word, by the, by his creative word of power, a living soul was formed, an earthen vessel designed to be a dwelling for my Lord. And that, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, God's spirit dwells in us and a lot of times we talk about Jesus Christ ascending back into heaven. But when he did, he sent his Holy Spirit. When the believer believes the gospel today, his body becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. And then in case someone didn't get that, which is in you, which you have of God. Uh, it reminds me of the time that I heard a man preaching that he says, I just don't believe that God's Holy Spirit actually indwells these fleshly bodies of ours. I'm thinking of this verse as, well, what you're really saying then, I don't believe this verse. Because it not only says, don't you know, so it's a fact that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, then it emphasizes which is in you, the Holy Ghost is in you, which you have of God, God gave you and sealed you with that Holy Spirit, uh, and you're not your own, you now belong to him. But anyhow, these bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost, that Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, and that the purpose of that is that even though Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven, the life which we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Therefore, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Uh, that, that poem that I just referred to, <laughs> that same author, I realize, is a poem that I've taped on the back of my Bible for some time ago, 
where that poem began by saying, O make my soul a mirror, Lord, reflecting only thee, until this life becomes transformed, revealing Christ in me. And uh, that lady really has an idea of what it is to be a Christian, the life of Christ manifests in our life. And this passage of scripture that we're going to study today is all about that. Now, as I said, uh, we're going to be looking at verses 19 and 20 and just letting it speak to, ourself, uh, to us. Uh, you can understand what it says. It's real quick, easy to understand, but we'll, we'll think about it a little bit. But before we do, I want to review a couple things. First of all, in verses 13 through 18 that we studied three weeks ago, uh, I just want, want to remind you of two thoughts. Let me read the verses to you. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, it says, Meat for the belly and belly for the meats, but God hath destroyed both, God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath, hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them a member, member of harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined unto a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So without going through the details of that, you realize there that, that this passage is dealing with fornication. The whole chapter is, and, and all the way back to chapter 5, has been dealing with fornication. Fornication among the believers and, and how to deal with that in chapter 5. And then this, this chapter here reminding believers that what they were is not what they should be, uh, how they should be acting. They should live in who they are in Christ. And, uh, and there's a warning here in these passages. First, the... Uh, that the warning of fornication, um, that our bodies are not for fornication, but they're for the Lord. So as we think about the verses 19 and 20, you begin to understand that, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the head of the body. We're members of Him. And these bodies of ours are not for fornication. They're for Him, and He is there for us to be our Lord, to, to be the one that would tell us how to live and how to glorify Him. Um, but the other part of that that I wanted you to, to remember is that verse 18, it's quite an interesting verse, that every sin that a man doth is without the body. And I, I take that with being outside of the body. Uh, every, you use your body to sin, but what it means is, but he that, that uh, committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Usually sin is doing something against someone else and certainly breaking God's laws. But fornication is a particular sin that is a sin against your own body, one that is a, uh, that, that is a violation against your own body. It's certainly a defilement of your body. It is really, in, in, in what that verse is expressing, a prostitution of your body. You selling yourself out, your body out, no matter who you are, male or female that there is a particular place that God has designed for that intimacy to take place. We'll learn about that in chapter 7 as it will continue in the beginning of that, of how to deal, how to not succumb to fornication. The answer to fornication is in chapter 7, so that will conti continue that subject. But just to understand that particular sin has is, is really been the subject matter, and that that particular sin carries with it a consequence of against your own body. You're sinning against yourself. And, uh, and, and it takes some thought to think about that, but that's exactly what it is. You're violating your very own being when you, when, when you commit fornication. Um, so anyhow, we, we, that's what we looked at last time. And the time before that, I need to go back to verses 9 through 12 here. Not back, 9 through 11. L look at that verse again. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effemates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So that, it's that, that the conclusion there is they will inherit because they have been washed, they have been sanctified, they have been justified in the name of Jesus Christ because of what Jesus Christ did, not because of their own actions. 
And it's by the Spirit of our God that we have been given God's Holy Spirit and the Spirit of life has been given to us the moment we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the Spirit of God has sanctified us, set apart us as holy unto God. We're washed first, cleansed, set apart as holy, and then, uh, and then justified, declared righteous. God has declared us righteous. So that, uh, that, that we, what we did last time is we looked at verses 9 and 10, and I realized that maybe I should define each one of those sins, particularly the one that says effemates. That's a, a man acting feminine, and, and today we call that transvestites. Uh, we live in a society that I think is extremely strange. Uh, and just in the last five years, the, the change that took place in our society where some of the sins that were looked at as gross, immoral sins are looked at as just natural, and the rest of us must just... We're, we're oddballs to think that those things are wrong. Uh, there's a... Just this week, a uh, 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 funeral home. A man who worked for them decided he is a woman is going to become a woman. And so they fired him, and they're in big trouble for a lawsuit for firing him because he decided he was going to be a transvestite. Uh, there, when we were on vacation, I got to watching the news, and it was real clever what the news did. They were talking about that because of the, the new acceptance of all, that there's been an increase, let's see, I've got to think of how they said that, an increase in corrective surgery. What they mean is actually making a man a woman surgically. Uh, but they didn't call it... Uh, you know, they called it corrective surgery, implying that God made a mistake when he made these per people the certain way, and scientists now are going to correct what they really are to match their whatever they think they are rather than what God has made them to be. Anyhow, I say that to you because uh, it's really strange in our society, and, and when you read these verses, the Corinthian society really hasn't changed. <laughs> Back here in Corinth, there were transvestites. There were, that next verse, that ne ne next thing, it says, uh, uh, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor uh, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effemates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And that's actually, a, a, we, when we defined those words last time, that's actually just homosexual. That, and, uh, and, and, and that's... It's just a, a softening way of saying that, but that's, that's what it's a reference to, homosexuality. And, and we looked at that and looked at that list. But one of the things that, that pricked my heart, and it really did back when I preached it a couple weeks ago, and I had notes, but it was notes that afterthoughts that I wrote on the side and I never shared them. And when I went home, it pricked my heart that I didn't share them. So before I can go on in verses 19 and 20, there's something important I want to share with you about that. Look again at verse 11. And such were some of you. So first of all, they, all these sins that are listed here, they were, the Corinthians were involved in, in one or all those sins as a group. They were involved in all of those sins. But the word starts with but. It's, and such were some of you. And then it says, but ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and by the Spirit of our God. So that there's been a change that took place. And, and my thinking about that is, God was willing to save them in all those particular sins. Sometimes we talk rough about those sins. I have because I can't get, I, I'm not going to be acceptable to those sins. I'm uncomfortable around those sins. I've had to counsel a couple homosexual men and who came and needed counseling. And uh, one fighting it and the other didn't know he should fight it. And, uh, and, and I, I had no problem dealing with them in a loving way. Uh, but outside of that, until they approach you, I just have a hard time. <laughs> uh, uh, just thinking and, and, and thinking about how to deal with someone like that. Uh, and, and when we cha studied chapter 5, we found out that, that certain sins, fornication is just another way, that uh, uh, one or another name for those sins, uh, that we learned in chapter 5 that we're not to held, have them in our fellowship. So it sounds like we're really hard against them, and there's a sense in which we are hard against that sin. But it's a reminder when you read verses 9, 10, and 11 that the Corinthians were in that state, 
And God was willing to save them. Which really speaks to the heart of the love of God. I'd like you to hold your place here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you could, put your bulletin there because there's other... We're going to come back to Ephesians 2 in, in several other places, uh, several other times. But look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. God's grace will save all sinners. Because Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, died for all sin of all mankind. And, and that verse, you know, sometimes I've always heard, like John 3.16 is like the greatest verse about God's love. And learned a long time ago that you say, for God so loved the world. You put a lot of O's after the so. You know, God so loved the world. But this verse... I mean, when John said that, he was still, that same chapter talks about, or the next chapter is salvation is of the Jews. <laughs> and salvation of the world will, will come through the Jews at the end. But in God's grace, God postponed the end of the world to bring salvation to all mankind in this dispensation of grace that we're living in today. And Paul says, even when we were dead in sin, or verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy... For his great love, God's love is great. And God loves, if you take that list in Corinthians, God loves the fornicator. He loves the idolater. He loves the adulterer. He loves the, the transvestites, I'll use those terms. He loves the homosexuals, whether you call them gay, lesbian, and all those other initials that people give them. He loves, he loves the thieves. He loves the covetous. He loves drunkards. He loves revilers. He loves extortioners. And, and he loved them enough to provide for their salvation. He loved them enough that if they'll believe the gospel, he'll save them from hell and from damnation. He'll give them eternal life. He'll make them his. He, 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 upon salvation, he'll, he'll sanctify them two ways. Positionally, he... He, he sets them apart from their sins, separates them. Well, when you read that passage in Corinthians, those people, it's not just talking about the action of those people. Those people, it says, um, the fornicators, idolaters, adulterers. He's actually calling people those sins. They're identified with those sins because they're in their sins. But then he says, but ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified. They're no longer identified with their sins because sanctified means set apart as holy unto God. God separated them from their sins and they're not identified with those sins. They're not in their sins. They're not condemned for their sins. They now belong to God. He loves them enough to save them and sanctify them positionally but also practically by giving them the Holy Spirit giving them the power not to succumb to the sins of the flesh. And, and so there's a practical sanctification, and he'll empower them that way as well. He will set them apart as holy unto himself for his service. So, boy, you know, I was thinking about that passage, and I was thinking, man, alive, right there in the passage, that they were involved in all those things, and God loved them. And if we're going to be servants of God, we need to love them too. We don't have to love their sin. We don't have to accept their sin and don't ever do it. But the person that's in those sins, God loved them. Jesus Christ died for them. And it's our job to extend that love to them and tell them about the gospel and get them saved. If they're not invited to church here, certainly, you know, if they come in, we don't kick people out. But they're certainly not going to stay for a long time listening to the kind of preaching we preach. And, and then it wouldn't be acceptable if they're going to practice that lifestyle and, and dwell among us. But the whole point is, is church is for saved people to get edified. But then saved people go out in the world where the sinners are at, and it's our job to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and tell them about this great love of God and all that Christ accomplished when he died on the cross. He took that sin. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not our righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ. 
And so I, I, it just pricked my heart to think, you know, here you know, we speak of evil about all those sins, and we ought to. And yet, the, right there before our face is the great love of God that he wants to save them, has saved the Corinthians that have trusted in Jesus Christ and washed them and cleansed them from that sin. So I needed to go back and remind you of those things. Now, let's go to our verses. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And Paul is talking to here about the believers, the ones, that's been, the ones that have been washed, the ones that have been sanctified, set apart as holy. And understand that the definition of sanctification. Set apart as holy unto God for his service. You know, back in the Old Testament, they, they sanctified all the instruments that they used to do sacrifices in the temple. Not only the people, the priesthood had to be sanctified, but all the utensils they used because they were set apart as holy for God's service. And, and through Jesus Christ's blood that he shed, we are sanctified, set apart as holy unto God for his service. And that's what these verses are, are making us to understand. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? Now, he's just been talking to them about fornication, and fornication is not for the body, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Jesus Christ, we're made members of Christ, and he's the head of the body, and so we're, filled, we're, we're given the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, it's, he's in us, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. So that the very purpose of our life is for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Now, the one thing that I want you to see in the verse is the you in this passage. For instance, when the verse closes in verse 20, it says, uh, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Man is a triune being. Spirit soul, and body. Where's the soul in that passage? Think about it. It's the word you. You are the soul. That's, he's right. What know ye not, now ye is plural, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's writing believers, reminding believers that when you got saved, your body became a temple. Israel had a temple. God met in the, in the holy place in that temple. He dwelled in that temple. He dwelled among the nation of Israel in that temple. God's not dwelling in temples made by hands. God today actually takes, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and puts His Holy Spirit in the believer, your body becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. But when I say your body is a temple, you are the soul that this passage is talking about. You would understand your being, that you are a soul who has a spirit and dwells in a body. Uh, we quoted, uh, I think it was Wednesday, uh, that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That, that's an expression of this house, that's this body of this tabernacle, the earth that we walk around in. So that our bodies... Are the, are the, uh, it, it, our soul is in our body, and our soul has a spirit. It has a human spirit that's dead to the things of God, but when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's Holy Spirit comes in and dwells and bears witness with your spirit. So you have not only a human spirit, you have the divine spirit in you as well. And you're to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. So you need to realize that you are the soul. Uh, Genesis says that in, when God created man, he formed man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed. So there's a body. God takes the dust of the earth, he made a clay man, forms it perfectly, then he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. God imparts life. And he put life inside that body, and then it says, and man became a living soul. So you have a body, the spirit that God gave of life, and then man becomes a living soul. That living soul will, will exist forever. It'll spend eternity somewhere. The body will die. You take, for instance, even the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Just before he died, he said to God the Father, Into thy hands I commend thy spirit, my spirit. And, and uh, we're, we learn in the book of Ecclesiastes that the, uh, upon death, the spirit of man goes back to God. God gives us life, and when we die, he takes that, that physical life back. 
we who know the Lord as our Savior, we, our soul, goes with our spirit to God, absent from the body, present with the Lord. A lost man whose spirit goes back to God, we take his body and put it in a grave so it doesn't smell because it's going to corrupt, but his soul immediately goes to a place of destiny. Lost man, man died and was buried, the Bible says, and in hell he lift up his eyes. So when a person dies, their spirit goes back to God, their soul goes to the place of destiny, heaven for the believer, hell for the lost person, and his body just goes to a grave. So man is that triune being, and in this passage, he's talking to us, we are the soul that this is talking about, of how we're going to use this body and this spirit. Now the spirit is the seat of your intellect. How can a man know the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? And how can we know the things of God save the spirit of God is in us? So God has given us his Holy Spirit so that we can know the things of God. But we can relate to another man because we have the spirit of man. The, the spirit is the seat of your intellect. The body is the vehicle that you walk around in, that you can actually use in this earth that we live in to get things accomplished. But not just accomplished for you. The purpose here is that you have a body and you have a spirit which are God's. You're to glorify God in your spirit, in the seat of your intellect, and in your body, which belongs, uh, which belongs to God, to let God use this body for His glory. And when I say this body, this mortal flesh, God will use this body here. He'll use it. That reference over in verse 15 says, uh, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? No, it's verse 14. And God hath raised up, uh, has raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by His own power. We have a body now to be used for the Lord, but the body, we're going to have a new body in resurrection, but we'll serve the Lord for all eternity. The reason we have a body, the reason we exist, is to glorify God in these bodies and in our spirit, which are God's. So this passage is making sure that you understand that. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter... Uh, well, flip over there just so you see it. Hold your place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says in verse 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And if you notice that holy there begins with a W. We're talking about your whole being. God to sanctify your whole being. And so the whole being is described. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. There's the three parts of man. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's possible to do that because verse 24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God can work in you. He sanctified your soul the moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He, he'll sanctify your spirit as you take in the Word of God and, and, and transform by that Word. And then He'll sanctify and actually use your body as a holy vessel for Himself. He'll sanctify you wholly. Uh, and, and Paul prays that the, the, the Thessalonians would, would allow God to do that in their life. So, but you see the whole being of man in those verses. In those verses, God sanctify you wholly, your whole spirit, soul, and body. You learn how God works in a person today. He, he saves you, and he puts his Holy Spirit in you, and when he puts his Holy Spirit in you, he, he sanctifies your spirit, he starts working in the spirit, in the spirit of your mind, and then the spirit of your mind starts taking over your heart. That is the thinking capacity of your soul. Your soul is the seat of your emotion, will, and appetite. When I say appetite, think of those verses that we read in Corinthians. They had an appetite for fornication. Their soul is being tempted there. And, and God will sanctify you, but he works in you spirit, and then the spiritual part the, the, where God works in you then works into your heart and then becomes, your body then becomes a vessel. That's an important order to get because the world thinks about man as body, soul, and spirit. And the reason we do that is that's how Satan works on us. Eve in the garden, 
God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and, she, and, and the Satan told her that the day you eat of, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll know some things. So the verse goes on to say, she saw that the tree was good for food and desired to make one wise. Saw and then came the desire. Now her heart's desiring that. Then she took and ate physically. So she, she corrupted, Satan attacked her and she corrupted herself by first visually seeing it, taking it, and then thinking this is going to make me wise, it's going to change me, I'm going to be like the gods, spiritual. And there's a fall there. Look, I told you to hold Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. John, 1 John talks about the love of the world. He calls... Uh, uh, love not the world, neither the things in the world. All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, body. Lust of the eyes, the soul, the gate to the soul. And the pride of life, spirit. Satan attacks you that way. That's why fornication is such a, a sin that, that Satan uses to corrupt the believer. Where God wants to work the other way, build you up spiritually. Philippians says... For it is God that worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in us spiritually to will, to take control of our heart, to do, to serve the Lord. So God works in us spirit, soul, and body. Uh, in this passage, chapter 2 of Ephesians, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, now, he's talking about before you got saved. Quicken means made alive, and I'll, I'll even back up later and, take, and explain that one to you. But in, in time past, before God made you alive, when you were dead in sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So you walk that way because Satan was working in you, guiding you, leading you along, and as a result, verse 3 says, among whom also we all had our conversation, our life, our lifestyle. In time past, here it is, in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, there's your heart, the heart of your soul, and of the mind, there's your spirit that's corrupted. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So... The whole point of this is when we start talking about how God's working today, God works first, you get a person saved, and then it begins to work in our mind. God works, he takes his word and transforms our life. Paul, after he teaches some doctrine in Romans, he says, I therefore beseech you that, I'm going to quote the wrong verse, <laughs> uh, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The first thing that when a person gets saved, they need to grow spiritually, learn some things from God's word, learn some doctrine, learn who God has made you, learn that you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified, and then take that to heart because now it's going to transform your life so that you present yourself a living sacrifice unto God. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. There's a decision made in the heart of how you're going to use your spirit and how you're going to use your body and, and to glorify God in that way. So a person needs to be renewed in their mind. You're holding Ephesians still? Look over in Ephesians chapter 4. If I start in verse 17, it says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk. How? In the vanity of their mind. <laughs> they have vain thinking, empty-headedness, concerning reality and what's right and what's wrong. And, and, and they walk that way because of their vain mind. It says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling, now they don't even feel guilty about anything, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness, no stopping it, with greediness. Now, I read that, not so much talk about the lost people, it's about you. Verse 20. 
but ye have not so learned Christ. If so, that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. How do you put off that old lifestyle? Well, you learn Christ, and then you put that off. Verse 23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's a renewing of your mind. So my point is, is the way God works in us is he renews our mind, and from there he takes our will. Look over in chapter 6 of Ephesians, verse 6. Among other things, it's talking about the whole list of things that, that transpire as you're filled with the Spirit. But verse 6 says, Be not, uh, uh, he says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of God, doing the will of God from the heart. So you're, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, and now you're serving God, you're filled with the Spirit, uh, and doing the will of God from the heart. And then you're using your body to do that. Look back at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now I backed up to, to read that verse because we're saved to good works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved by grace. But we're saved unto good works. And, and Ephesians chapters 1, 2, 3 talk about what God has given us in His grace, the heavenly position and all. And then when you get to chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation and for your homework assignment. If you want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, read the book of Ephesians, but particularly when you get to chapters 4 through 6, mark down every time you see the word walk. Because walk is how you're going to live your life here, Right? You've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, doing the will of God from your heart, and now here's how to walk. Walk as dear children. Walk as children of the light. But I'll let you look at those verses. Because that transforming of your mind is now going to take control of your heart if you'll let it, if you take God's word in, and it'll have an action in life. Sanctified. That, that, that's how it is that you can go to that passage in Corinthians and say, uh, to glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. It's by the, taking in your soul, being transformed by your, your spirit, being transformed and changing your soul, your attitude, your heart, so that you're, you become, you use your body to glorify the Lord. Now, something else about that passage, go, uh, if you hopefully got that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. That, when it says in verse, I, I, I'm going to say this in reverse order, but I'll read the verses again. Verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? That's just, you need to know that true so that you realize that, that your life is not your own. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. I want you to think about you're bought with a price. And that, that phrase, you're not your own. Because sometimes we think we're our own person. But we're not. We've been bought with a price. And, and that price is the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying on the cross and paying for our sins. Redeeming us is the, is the, is the expression that's being used there. And now we belong to him. So that you need to understand that that is a fact, and therefore, if your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and we're not our own, that we're bought with a price, we then, the very purpose of our existence is to glorify God. So when you think about being bought with a price, as I said, that, that is the idea of redemption. Other places, the Bible talks about us being redeemed. Peter says being redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But redemption, it comes out of the Old Testament and it has a concept there where, where in the Old Testament there is, it's called a law of redemption. And back there it had to do with slavery. And that someone who, because of a debt, became someone's slave and he's got to pay off that debt and sometimes those debts are pretty big and he could be a slave for a number of years, maybe even the rest of his life. So that he becomes a slave, but the slave can be put onto the market to be sold. 
And the, the law of redemption is that if there was a near of kin who was first able, but then also willing, he could actually go pay that person's debt, redeem him from the slave market, and set him free. See, because if someone else does it, they're going to redeem him from the slave market, he's going to become their slave. <laughs> but, but someone who's near to kin, who has the ability to pay the price, can, can save that man from the slave market, of the, the slave market and, and then set him free. And, and the redemption is that the Lord Jesus Christ went into the slave market of sin, shed his blood, he came, became like a man near kin, went to the slave, went to the slave market and, and, and died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he paid completely for our sins, and we're set free. We're free from the bondage of sin. We're free from slavery to sin, but we belong to the Lord. There's no one, there's no in-between. Either you're a slave, you belong to sin, to Satan, destined for hell, or you belong to the Lord, you're saved, sanctified, justified, and, and you're on your way to heaven. There is no, there's no in-between there. And this passage is reminding you that you're bought with a price and that you're not your own, and therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit. Well, when you think about that idea of that, that there's two errors that come up in theology. One is called Calvinism, uh, where they actually don't believe in man ever having any free will. They actually believe what a Calvinist believes is that man is so depraved by his sin that he can't even believe the gospel to be saved unless God would give him the faith to believe and then he become a believer. And then be, God doesn't give everybody the faith to believe. He chooses arbitrarily. They said there's no really reason why, rhyme or reason, which who gets saved or not. But it's by God's choice that he gives certain people the faith and therefore that's how they become a believer and now they're saved. There is no free will, no choice. It's God's choice and he chooses certain people to be saved and leaves the other ones lost. That's a Calvinistic point of view. I hope you're holding Ephesians because I want to show you that is not even close to biblical. In fact, when you, when you study Calvinism and the people who write about that, you realize how intellectual these men are. And that's really an intellectual, theological argument that's contrary to the very character of God. God's will is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's against the character of God, certainly against the love of God, the great love wherein he loved us. But it's also against Scripture because... You don't get the Holy Spirit so that you can come a, so that you can co become a believer. You get the Holy Spirit after you become a believer. Ephesians chapter one verse. I'll start in verse twelve. It says that ye should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, how is it that you trusted in Christ, by whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. Notice, after you hear the word of truth. After you hear the gospel of your salvation. Also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. We've been purchased. He's gonna, we're the purchased possession, but He's going to take possession of us at the rapture when He comes and calls for us and we're called into glory and get our new glorified body. That's when he takes possession of us. But until he takes possession of that possession he's purchased already, he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit that we belong to him. But that took place after we believed, not so we could believe. So what a Calvinist teaches about no free will, that's wrong. God has provided faith in that. Not, not that he gave us the faith to become a believer. He provided faith in that he provided a witness of himself. He provided salvation by the cross. He provided a means by which you could hear the gospel. He provided the very preaching of the gospel. He, he provided uh, the preserved word of God so that you could check and find out what from the Bible exactly what God said how to be saved. And, and God gave man free will to believe or not to believe. And both, to believe and not to believe, have a consequence. So Calvinism is wrong. But the reason I even brought that up is there's what the other side is, it's called Arminianism. 
And, and they're just as wrong. Arminians argue that a person can't choose, uh, that a person can't lose, uh, can, excuse me, that a person can lose his salvation. He's not eternally saved the moment that he believes because if he did, he would lose his free will. And after salvation, he must be able to decide he doesn't want to be saved anymore, doesn't want to believe anymore, and therefore can, by his own free will, not be saved. So he can choose not to have eternal life after he's saved, and so they don't believe in eternal security. But that's against Scripture too, is it not? We just read that after you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit because you become the possession of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. What happened to those verses? So that, that idea of trying to keep free will, like you can free will, will yourself out of salvation after you were saved, doesn't match Scripture. Because in life, some decisions have eternal consequences. Decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior has an eternal consequence. You have eternal life. The decision not to believe the gospel has eternal consequences. Hell. And you don't have the free will to tell God, I don't want to trust Jesus Christ and I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to, I want to go somewhere else. That's not your will. That's not your choice. You're going to go somewhere when you die. So some decisions you can't take back. Everybody knows this. Words that you say can't be unsaid after you say them. Oh, I have free will. I don't want that to go out. It's too late. Just this week, a woman shot her son. And now, the, whoever was talking about that was talking about, you know, guns are dangerous, and that once you pull the trigger, the bullet can't come back. You make a decision that has consequences when you pull that trigger of that gun. And, and you, you, I lost my free will. No, you had a free will, shoot or not shoot, but once you shot, the consequences follow. And, and so you can make a whole bunch of things about like that. One, one thing that I warn people about, it comes out of that passage, in, in Corinthians, is that sometimes people get really depressed and get suicidal. And one of the things that I've counseled people who think suicidal is I take them to that passage and says, "What? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You don't have to think this way. You can be transformed and think the way God would have you to think. Because you're bought with a price and you're not your own. I'm going to take my own life. It's not yours to take. You're bought with a price. You belong to God. Glorify God in your body and your spirit. How's that going to happen? Committing suicide. Someday. Somebody's going to commit suicide. One second later, the rapture is going to take place. Whoa. But no matter when you, a person commits suicide... They're going to stand before Jesus Christ who loved them and gave himself for him and gave them a life that they could live here on earth for his glory and they chose not to do it. And then they're going to face the Savior who did much more, suffered more than anything they might have suffered in this life when he took their sins upon himself and died on that cross. But suicide is a decision that you can't undo once you do it. Neither can you be unwashed after you get saved, unjustified, unsanctified, unredeemed, no such things. So I, I say that to, to make these points. Take your Bibles, and we're going to close, but I, I'll make a statement, then we'll read the verse. Come to Romans chapter 6. Before you were saved, and I'm not going to show you these verses, we read some in Ephesians. Before you were saved, you walked according to the course of this world, led by Satan. You were, according to Romans 6, 17, the servant of sin. You were, according to Romans chapter 7, verse 14, you were sold under sin. And according to Colossians, you were under the power of darkness. But when you believed the gospel, when you trusted what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for your sins and receive salvation, you were, re you were redeemed, you were justified, you were, we use the word saved, the Bible uses that word, you were sanctified, and none of those things can be undone. You have become one with Jesus Christ, born of God, made part of the body of Christ, you became His. And the Bible says, He will not deny Himself. He's taking you to heaven whether you want to go there or not. By the way, read that sometime, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. Yes, you're... Uh, yeah, uh, you are you're not your own, you are his, 
He is the Lord. That's what the passage is all about. And you, you were saved to serve him now and for eternity. The question is not, after you're saved, who do you serve? That's settled. You're not to serve sin, you're to serve the Lord. The question really is, how well are you serving? Look at, look at uh, Romans chapter 6, and let me just break into it in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? Whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. If you serve sin with your life, it's just going to bring death. No life there. But you can, be, you can serve the Lord. You can be obedient unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. There was a time you had no choice about it. But now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That doctrine is for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Being made then free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and unto iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. Drop down to verse 21. It's, well, I might as well just keep reading at this point. For, for when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness... What fruit had ye then in those things whereunto you are now ashamed? Why would you serve sin? What fruit did it bear in your life? You know, this is being transformed by the renewing of your mind. It didn't, it didn't, it was just nothing but death. It didn't produce any good fruit. The end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, ye became servants to God, and have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, and Jesus Christ paid that for you. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The question is not who you serve, you serve the Lord. The question is how well are you serving him? Well, think about that passage and yield yourself as instruments of righteousness unto God for his glory. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do pray that some of what we said here, that there's something for each person to think about. But may we understand the very purpose of our existence is to come to first get saved, to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and then belong to you. And then in belonging to you, to allow you to work in us spirit soul and body so that our soul has made a decision that both in spirit and in body to glorify you and I pray father that what we said today might be some heartfelt decision making on what you're, we're going to do with our life realizing what our existence is really all about in Christ's name we pray amen Thank you, Pastor. Let's stand and sing that wonderful chorus, Jesus Paid It All, number 77, if you need it. Jesus Paid It All Dismissed.